classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 26, Nonlinear Viscoelastic Phenomena. I'm Professor Phillies, and today we're going to continue our discussion of polymer dynamics. We're going to talk about nonlinear effects in polymer solutions. Uh, if we ask what sort of effects are there, there are three sorts of things that are covered by the general notion of nonlinear effects. There are issues involving the pressure tensor. which describes the forces within the liquid. There are issues involving memory, namely the polymer solution has some rather long relaxation times that you can see experimentally. And there, then there are what I will somewhat vaguely describe as modern methods, <coughs> things that can now be done that were not done historically. So the starting point of the discussion is, what are the forces within a fluid? So we imagine we have here a small cube of fluid. It does not have to be a cube. I can make one of the thicknesses extremely small relative to the other two. And we have coordinate axes, so here is x and here is y, and here is z, and we ask what are the forces on the liquid. The general statement is we have this object, and across each surface, for example, this surface, there is a force across this surface, but the force across this surface has a component in the x direction and a component in the y direction and a component in the z direction. The component in the z direction is, the, is a compressional or tractional force across the fluid, extensional force. The sideways forces are shearing forces. How can we represent this force? Well, what we do is we introduce an object known as the pressure tensor. And the pressure tensor has components, Px,x, Px,y, Px,z, Py,x, Py,y, Pz,z, Pzx, Pzy, Pzz. That should be a y. And the pressure tensor describes these forces. And the way it describes the forces, first of all, this we said was a tensor. It's a three by three matrix. It's equal to that. And what we do to ask what those forces are in terms of the pressure tensor is we dot the pressure tensor with a unit vector parallel to one of these that is perpendicular to a face. So for example, here is i hat, the unit vector perpendicular to the yz plane, which is in turn perpendicular to x. And so, for example, i hat dot p is i hat dot these things. Uh, there is slight mixed mathematical symbolism here. This is a 3 by 3 tensor. We're dotting a vector into it. And what do we get out? We get out the force, and it's a vector. This is the vector force perpendicular to the x-axis. That's not the same as the x component of the force, and that force is Pxx i hat plus Pxy j hat plus 
PXC k hat. So there are forces across that surface, and the force across that surface have an x, a y, and a z component. For those of you who want to see this in unit vector form, you would write f vector x is i hat, that's this i hat, dot pxx, that's the outer product of two unit vectors, plus pxy i hat j hat, plus pxz i hat k hat. And there you have the pressure tensor. Now you might say that you vaguely recall having heard about pressure, oh, someplace back in the sixth grade, and you don't remember pressure being a tensor. And the answer is that if you were in a simple liquid that isn't doing anything terribly interesting, the pressure tensor is P0, 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 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Better close it. That is, there is a pressure. It is a single number. Uh, it gives the force across the x, the y, and the z faces of the cube. And they're the same on all sides. <clears throat> now, there's one comp additional issue that gets skipped over, and the book might confuse people on this, having reread it one more time. And the issue is as follows. Here is our cube. Okay. And we said the force across the x face is given by this object. And you might legitimately ask, is it this x face, or is it the x face on the other side? And the answer is, if it's a very small cube, then first approximation, it's the pressure is the force on both surfaces is the same. Now that's clearly imprecise, because if we have a pressure, we have the force across the surface, there's no, there's no necessary obligation that the um, force cannot be changing as position goes on. That is, we could have, for example, dfx dx. And the question is, how big are those forces? And the answer is, there are two ways that the differences between the two phases can be significant. The first way that the forces can be significant is if the object, the volume is being accelerated very rapidly, and then the different, if we have, say, an acceleration in the x direction, uh, the net of all of the um, x direction forces across all six faces had better not be zero, it had better be ma. However, for the most part, we talk about inertial systems, or inertial less systems, that is, systems that are so heavily damped that we do not have to worry about inertia. And in that case, the um, sum of the face forces has to be zero. Furthermore, in saying the sum of the forces ha has to be zero, I can always take the volume to approach being a sheet. Yes? And if the volume has approached being a sheet, uh, <clears throat> the volume, the um, Thickness becomes very small. The area of the side faces, because now we have a volume like this, the area of the side faces becomes very small relative to the top and the bottom. And therefore, for this very thin volume, the top and bottom forces are almost all the force. And if that force has to sum to zero, the forces here and here have to be the same. That's an approximation saying there's no inertia. Similarly, in addition to there being no in, um, inertia, you also want to say that the body forces have to be small. That is, <clears throat> if this is a liquid someplace, there's a force of gravity on it, probably, presumably. 
and because there is a force of gravity on it, there's a weight, and the lifting the force downwards here and the force upwards there had better be arranged to match the weight because the thing doesn't fall. And therefore, there will be a pressure gradient as you go downward, but under normal conditions, that's also negligible. And you should realize that was just an approximation. It's not exact. Furthermore, it must be the case, since the volume is very small, if you're saying inertia is negligible, then the moment of inertia should also be treated as negligible, and the angular momentum stored inside this object should be neglected. That's again an approximation. However, if the angular momentum is to be negligible, Let's look down on the box from above. We're now looking down from the box from above. And we will look at the angular momentum relative to this center. Well, in order for the angular momentum to be negligible, the torque on the object must be negligible. And therefore, the um, torque this way across this surface and the torque this way across this surface had better add to zero. That's again an approximation. However, within that approximation, we're saying the tor this torque adds to zero. This is saying, well, let's see. This is the um, x-axis. This is the y-axis. This is the force in the x-direction across the y-axis. That's p, y, x. And this is the force across the x, the plane perpendicular to x in the y direction. This is p x y. Those two would better be, and therefore, p x y and p y x should match. <clears throat> now that's fine as long as the angular momentum is negligible. And in the hydrodynamic problems, that's typically a safe assumption. One can go far astray into other areas, and then you could better worry about whether it's true or not. But the assertion is that the matrix must therefore be symmetric, and our simple fluid liquid P00 is symmetric. Okay. And we now ask what happens to the pressure tensor if we make life a little more complicated. We now introduce a convention. And the convention, there actually is a rheological organization and to keep people's um, attention on important things, they have the following convention. <coughs> we have a fluid velocity, and the fluid velocity is in the x direction. If we have a shear, kappa, or if you prefer gamma dot, a rate of displacement, the um, direction in which the fluid velocity is changing is the y direction. And so I will draw a picture of this. Here is a top plate. Here is a bottom plate. The bottom plate is stationary. The top plate has some velocity v sub x. The assumption, and we're going to get to the validity of this assumption in a bit, is that if I plot v sub x versus height, you see something like this. And v sub x at some distance y between the two plates. The two plates are at 0 and L. And V sub x is going to be y kappa. Kappa is also represented gamma dot. That is a fluxion. I'll explain why at some point. And this is divided by L, where cap L is the distance between the two plates. Now, if you look, the thing is moving this way, the gradient is this way, 
and there is a neutral direction z. Okay? There's a neutral direction. So we now take the liquid and we put a shear on it. And so several things happen. <clears throat> the one we're going to talk about first looks only at the diagonal components of the pressure tensor, PXX, PYY, PZZ. And in an equilibrium fluid, those components are all the same. In a polymer liquid, when you are shearing, they become unequal. Unequal? Oh yes, they're not equal to each other. And therefore, we can define something N1, which is PXX minus PYY, and N2, which is PYY minus PZZ. And having introduced the two ends, we don't need this anymore. This is just the direction in which we're getting a velocity shear. They have names, namely N1 and N2 are the first and second <clears throat> normal stress differences. Now the description of these things as being normal stress differences means that the pressure the liquid is exerting is not the same on, with respect to the three pr principal axes, x, y, z. If you go through the literature and go far, back far enough, you can find people who claimed n2 identically equal to zero, and the best that can be said for that assertion is that it is old and it is known to be wrong. There are normals, the two normal stress differences are not zero. They are zero if there's no shear. But if we increase the shear, the um, normal stress differences become um, unequal. If you think about this, um, there's a symmetry issue. And the symmetry issue, let's draw this again. Here's x. Here's y. Here is the velocity at some height. So we have some kappa, which is the velocity gradient. Yes. And as a result of the velocity gradient, the pressure this way and the pressure out of the plane become unequal. Yes. Now suppose I reverse the direction of the shear. Yes. I have reversed the direction of the shear. And so PYY and PZZ, Z is this way, Y is up, become unequal to each other. I've reversed the direction of the shear. Uh, however, if you think about the symmetry for a bit, uh, did we, should we reverse the direction of the pressure difference? Well, probably not, because if you walk around the far side, the room on, behind the wall and look in, you're going to be seeing the picture running backwards. That is, the system has, re, should have reflection invariance, and you can confirm that because if you, we imagine this blackboard is transparent, yes, people sitting on the far side of the wall looking in see the mirror image picture and they had better agree that what, as to whether PYY and PZZ are relatively larger or smaller than each other. And therefore, the argument works for both of these. Both of these should depend as kappa square. Okay? Now there's another f set of forces which I will simply drop in briefly, which are the terms that come in if, because there's a viscosity. And the point that there is a viscosity is, let's see, the liquid up here is moving, the liquid down there is stationary, 
So if we imagine this plane perpendicular to the y-axis, there's a force across it in the x-direction <coughs> because the liquid is viscous. And therefore, well, this is a force in the x-direction due to y. That's PYx. And therefore, PYx, and since the two of them are equal, PXY are not zero and are proportional to capita the first. Those go to zero if there's no shear force. The mirror argument, what does the mirror argument say? It said that it should be capita the first. Yes, um, if the um, shear, if the fluid is going that way, the dragging force is also in that direction. If I reverse the direction of the um, fluid flow is by standing on the other side of the blackboard and looking at it, the force also reverses direction, and therefore these two terms are capita the first. <clears throat> Okay, so that is the stress tensor, and that, those are the two normal stress differences. I am oversimplifying appreciably. However, from the standpoint of what we're going to do with these, I have said enough. You may say, okay, we have this solution, and because it has polymers in it, it has non-zero normal stress differences. What are the implications of this? And the implications of this are that polymer solutions have some fairly bizarre flow properties. They also have flow properties that involve not just the normal stress differences, but also involve, for example, the fact the system has memory. And I am now going to show what some of these peculiar flow properties are non-Newtonian flow properties. Um, the simplest one is called rod climbing. So let us imagine a simple experiment. And, and the simple experiment is we have our mixing bowl full of cream and I put in a stirring bar, and I start stirring, and we are going to turn the whipped cream, the cream into whipped cream. Well-defined experiment. And if you do this, what you observe, and this would be true, just as true if you had water, but for some time, it's even more true with water, the fluid moves away from the stirrer towards the edge of the container. This is certainly the normal expected behavior. In a polymer solution, you see exactly the opposite behavior. You see the liquid climbs up the rod. Now, why is the liquid climbing up the rod? I'm not showing the math. Okay, first of all, the answer is that we're doing, we're shearing the liquid because we're spinning. And we are shearing the liquid, and therefore kappa is not zero, and the normal stress differences are not zero. And G, we want to arrange things so that the top surface of the fluid has, is a surface of constant pressure. And there is a surface of constant pressure. You have to pile the liquid up because the um, normal stress differences become non-zero. Well, that's rod, rod climbing. I haven't explained the math details at all. The important issue is that rod climbing is actually a fairly demanding test on any model of polymer dynamics. Uh, there is a nice paper by Hossiger. It's referenced in the book. And the point of the book reference is that it's right there. Um, you try to compare this prediction of rod climbing against models of polymer dynamics, and you discover that some of them don't predict rod climbing. That's a serious flaw. Let us consider a few other 
exotic phenomena. This one is a little more complicated. So here is a pipe, and we are pushing a polymer solution or polymer melt out the end of the pipe. And if you've ever done this, it's like a lawn hose, basically. If you do this with water, the water flows out, and it heads off in more or less straight lines. If you do this with polymer melt, you get extrudate swell. An extrudate swell refers to the issue. The fluid comes out of the pipe, and it bulges and gets wider. And because it's getting wider, it also, of course, must be slowing down. Yes? Well, that's extra date swell. That's certainly not something you see in a conventional liquid. OK. There is a traditional trough experiment So we have a tilted flat object with walls, and we send the liquid running down it. And if you do this with water, the liquid surface is flat across the uh, range of the system. If you do this with polymer solution, you discover there's a bulge, which I have not necessarily drawn very well, and the fluid in the middle of the trough is higher than the fluid at the edges. Um, the nice book by um, Curtis and Bird, a polymer book, collects some dozens of these different strange effects. Uh, let's consider another one. Um, this is not, again, some of these are not easily understood as just saying, oh, normal stress differences. That's normal stress. This is normal stress. On the other hand, there's always drag reduction. <clears throat> and if we say there is drag reduction, what we mean is we are pushing liquid down a pipe. And if it's going fast, there tends to be turbulence at corners, and this increases the resistance to flow. So what we do is we drop into the liquid trace quantities, part per million quantities of high molecular weight polymer. And suddenly the drag reduces a great deal. There have been military experiments where the idea was you um, dump stuff out of the prow of the ship. You inject fluid out of the prow of the ship. And this will reduce drag, because you eliminate turbulence. Um, I haven't heard that this was put into effect, um, action, but it was an idea that someone thought was worth spending money on. Why is there drag reduction? Well, that may be related to another experiment. Here we have a very large bath full of liquid, and we open the drain hole in the bottom. This could, for example, be a large bathtub. And having dropped the liquid in, we then let it drain, and what you observe after a bit, there's angular momentum in the tub. The angular momentum cannot easily escape down the drain, and therefore, especially if you got it going a bit, you see a vortex forming, and you see entrained air bubbles, and you have this interesting thing right where it's draining. Mm -hmm. Yes? Drop some polymer in, mix, and this effect disappears completely. You see no vortex, and you see no entrainment of air bubbles. Now that's not that's Again, G, we put in a polymer, and the basic qualitative flow properties just changed appreciably. Um, oh, yes. There is a classical phenomenon with a famous photograph.
and the famous photograph is Lodge, and this is Lodge Sr., the father of the editor of Macromolecules, and what he does is as follows. He has a beaker, and we are pouring a polymer <coughs> solution out of the beaker. Yes? And so, and by the way, it's flowing very slowly. This is a very thick solution. And now, we go in with a pair of scissors and we cut the liquid, which you can do. You could not do this with liquid water. It's moving quite fast. But you can cut it. And what happens? Well, the piece down here goes to wherever it's going, and the piece up here retracts. It's a very highly viscous. It, it, the pieces of the, the adjoining pieces of the liquid behave as though they're connected to each other by little springs. This is the storage modulus I mentioned. This phenomenon is known as elastic recoil. There is a, and it's actually sort of the same phenomenon. Here we have a beaker, and we would like to get the polymer solution out of it to a container down here. So we will use a siphon, except we're going to cheat and use a tubeless siphon. Now, ordinary water, you need the tube because it has to do things. But what we do is we take this, and we it's this liquid drags and stretches. It has an extensional viscosity. And we, um, after carefully re repositioning the container so it will catch the spill, we've dragged the liquid out. And it flows over the top and down like this into the lower container. And it's being siphoned out even though it is not in contact. There's nothing there. And that is a matter the liquid behaves as though it's connected with itself over extended regions. Curiously, though the physics is entirely different, you can get exactly the same phenomenon using superfluid liquid helium. It will creep up the walls, creep down, and flow to the lower container without artificial intervention. Well, other than the artificial intervention, you need to keep the helium superfluid on this planet. So, there is elastic recoil, and this object is the tubeless siphon. Now, the issue here is there are a lot of odd flow phenomena which you would like to explain. The challenge is that some of these are a little difficult to quantitate. So, for example, I can say I cut it and it retracts. But what did you want to measure in there? How far it retracted? How fast it retracted? What happened as the scissors went through? So these are phenomena that are important, that are nonlinear. Some of them are hard to quantitate, and therefore are hard to drop trivially into a theoretical model. But that doesn't mean they aren't real. It just means they're a little different from the sort of phenomena we've been talking about so far in the book. Okay, and that is it for peculiar flow phenomena. And we will now push ahead and we will talk about memory effects. There are a bunch of these. The simplest, I'm going to sketch this as though we have an extremely, simply two infinitely long plates. And one is moving with respect to the other. And therefore, in the space between, there is a shear rate gamma dot. And we run the system, 
and we run it for a long time and we measure the force on the lower plate, the force we, or the force on the upper plate. We have to put forces on the two plates to get them to move with respect to each other and the force is determined by the shear rate. It's also determined by the viscosity. The sensible thing to talk about is the force per unit area, of course. Now we go in and we make a sudden change in the shear rate. And so if I plot, here's the time axis. I plot gamma dot comes along and it now jags up. So there is our sudden change in the shear rate. I've increased the shear rate. And now, having increased the shear rate, I ask what happens to the stress. There's a force per unit area that we need to do all this. And we ask, what does the, what does the um, stress do, PXY, PYX, if we do this? And the answer is, nothing at all happens until we change the shear rate. And then the stress pops up and comes down again. And there is in this region, you notice it's gone up. This is overshoot. That is, if we had a polymer solution that was habituated to being sheared at a particular rate. And we then suddenly increase the shear rate. We eventually get back to a steady state. But before we get back to the steady state, um, we have this transient known as overshoot. Um, the Curtis Bird book suggests that sometimes you can get oscillations. Uh, however, you can also propose several experimental artifacts uh, related to the inertia of the apparatus, etc., that would give the illusion of those oscillations even though they were not occurring. That is, it would be a, a machine artifact, not a physical artifact. What if you go in the other direction? Well, here's the time axis again. Here is our shear rate gamma dot, and we slow things down. And we ask what, what forces are involved to do this, and the answer is the force comes along, and it does that, and it recovers, and we have undershoot. That is, once again, uh, there is a memory effect. The system takes a while to accommodate to what is going on around it. Uh, the effects that I am describing can be also be this is this is um, the stress. You can also see the same sort of thing if you measure the first normal stress difference. That is, you change the shear rate, the polymer solution accommodates, but it does not accommodate instantaneously. Um, if you want, you can also do a more um, complicated experiment. I'm simply going to note the more complicated experiment. Namely, you can take um, the shear rate and you will say, we will have the two plates and we will have a gamma dot because we're oscillating the plates back and forth which is some a cosine omega t. It's oscillating, yes, and that is a dvx dy. And then you can add to it a second shear which is a constant, and the, cons the second constant part 
could involve another motion in the x direction, parallel, or it could Im involve a motion out of the plane of the board, perpendicular to the first shear. And now you have a liquid that's being subject to a fairly complicated set of displacements. Now you might say, could you also do a shear rate this way? Now, no, that's compression, and the, and the liquid would have to escape out to the sides, and that would get a little messier. So you want to keep, you do this so that the volume of fluid doesn't feel some obligation to flee. Okay, we have now described <clears throat> what goes on in these systems. So we will now push on to a different set of experiments. And these are experiments where we set control the shear rate. We move one plate with respect to the, the other, either at a constant speed or an oscillating speed. There are several actual, oh, I, why don't I briefly mention the sort of experimental configurations that do this. I mean, it's very nice to say, mathematically, we have two infinitely large plates. However, they wouldn't fit into the laboratory and they'd strain the budget. So there are several traditional arrangements which you do instead. And one arrangement is to say, this is a cylinder coming out of the board toward you. This is another cylinder sitting here. And I will rotate one cylinder with respect to the other. <clears throat> now the difficulty with that is that we're doing constant angular rotation. As you go out on the radius, uh, the shear rate is obliged to change. Or there's some other complication. Another answer is say we will have a small disk here. We will have another disk here. The liquid goes out forever, or at least far enough. The two disks don't. And we rotate one disk with respect to the other. And the distance between the two disks is a constant. Now that also has a problem, because if I look on the surface here, V equals omega r, yes, it's rotating. And that means the top surface here is moving much more quickly than the top surface here. And if I calculate dV, dY, there's a velocity, say, out of the plane of the board. And if I calculate the velocity gradient, it's proportional to r, because this distance is, the distances are the same and the velocities are larger. A way of avoiding this is called the cone and plate instrument. And the notion of the cone and plate instrument is that we have a conical plate like this. We have a flat plate like that. We rotate one plate with respect to the other at omega. And Vx, that's the velocity perpendicular to the board, is proportional to omega r. Yes. However, L, the separation between the two, is also proportional to r. And therefore, the ratio Vx over L, there's our gamma dot, is proportional to omega and is independent from r. In order to avoid complications where adjoining pieces of liquid are moving at different spaces, you keep the cone, the cone angle very shallow. So that's sort of how you do the experiment. And then if you want, there are more complicated alternatives, pipe flow, for example. OK, but now we're going to talk about a somewhat different experiment. So here is our bottom plate. Here is our top plate. And at t equals 0, they're like this. And then we displace the top plate with respect to the bottom plate through a distance gamma. Yes? Gamma is the strain. 
And what we do is an experiment in which I plot gamma versus t. Well, the simplest one, we start off with no strain, and then we suddenly displace one plate with respect to the other. Okay. Well-defined experiment. Not trivial to do because you have to displace the top plate with respect to the bottom one very quickly, get it up to a high speed to move it where you want it to be, and then stop it again in such a way it doesn't oscillate or other bizarre things. But it can be done. And we ask, what is the response? What is the force per unit area appropriately normalized with respect to gamma? And the answer is the force on the two plates due to the liquid is zero until we do the um, strain displacement. And then the force pops up. And at later times, decays downwards. This shape is G of T and gamma. It's a function of time, because if we wait long enough, the force disappears. It's, a fu it's also a function of gamma, because this is not a linear system. And therefore, we can measure G of T and gamma. Uh, what shape does it have? Well, approximately speaking, you can say it's a sum of two exponentials. Uh, you should realize, though, if you say it's the sum of two exponentials, um, Two exponentials will fit a lot of things, even if they aren't, it isn't quite perfectly right. So you shouldn't um, really be insistent that that's exactly the shape. If we go to large concentration in molecular weight, you shift from something that looks like this to something that has gotten bigger and has an initial very steep drop-off. And therefore, you change the concentration and the molecular weight, and something happens. And now we have the question of what behavior G of T and gamma has. Uh, you will notice I give several literature references, but I decided to stop the book without doing a detailed study of nonlinear response. There were several reasons for this. First of all, I was running up against a page count limit. I was also running against a time limit because I had to get the book to the publisher. I was also running up into something of an exhaustion limit because this had been going on for five years. And at some point, you want to bring projects to a stop. It was also very clear that the literature on this topic was very much in a state of flux. As opposed to most of the rest of what we have discussed, where um, if I had done the literature search and did it cut off a year or two later or a year or two earlier, yeah, there would be a few less or more figures, but there wouldn't be anything very new there. That is, there, there might be some additional measurements, but people would agree on what they were and what they said. The nonlinear stuff is currently in a state of um, instability, if you will forgive, very bad pun. And therefore, um, I decided to stop. I shall, however, illustrate, we're going to discuss G of T and gamma. And we are going to, dis I'm go simply going to note, it's in the book, an interesting bit. Suppose you plot G of t and gamma, that is, the uh, stress that's developed if you do a sudden strain of size gamma, and we ask what the force per unit area is as time goes on. Well, there is an analysis which is, as far as I know, everyone agrees is correct. In fact, both of these, everyone agrees is correct, but they're different. And what in no way, there, and 
collaborators do, there's a nice paper, they show if you look out at large times and you take g of t and gamma over some function of gamma, that is, if you multiply the curves by some constant, at large time, the curve, well, small time the curves may be different, but at large time, if you multiply the curves by gamma, the curves all lie on top of each other. And therefore, at long time, there's, the assertion is, a common relaxational process, which some people claim they know. And I don't believe there's any disagreement that if you do the mathematics, the curve moving around this way, you do see this. However, there is also the nice set of experiments by Tapadia. And the uh, analysis by Tapadia shows what happens if you start with the measurements themselves and look at the measurements themselves and don't overprocess them before you look at them. Because what they did is they plot not this is g of t gamma over this function of gamma, but what they did was to look at g of t gamma. And implicitly that's the same as saying they're going to look at and ask what f of gamma is. Yes. And what they demonstrate is f of gamma is not monotonic in gamma. That is, yes, you can make the curves agree with each other, but this division factor you um, have is a bit more complicated than, say, 1 over gamma. And the issue there is that there are a number of models that predict the second behavior, but if you ask what they would say about f of gamma, you would think you would, f of gamma would be monotonic in gamma. And their result is that it is not. <clears throat> okay. There's a further complex. This is supposed. This is supposed to be a critical test of some models of polymer dynamics. And we get to a nice review by Veneris, and it's beautifully done and extremely systematic. And what is done is to say that if we look at before, um, oh, what was the year? It's about. 2004, before about the year 2004, there are about two dozen studies, and about half of them show the predicted behavior, and about half of them don't. And so what is done is to do a very thoughtful and careful analysis and to look for artifacts. There is an extremely long list of artifacts that could cause various deviations from the expected theoretical behavior. And therefore, the proposal is that, in fact, you, sometimes you see the theoretical behavior, and sometimes your experimental apparatus is uncooperative and causes you problems. If you read that paper carefully, though, there is one bit that does not get done. I'm not faulting the author, and it, maybe it really was done, and I just missed the point. But the question is, were those artifacts taking place in the studies which did not find the expected answer, or in the studies that did find the expected answer, and it isn't com as completely sorted out? Now, of course, this would be a little more delicate to do, because if you're saying X is wrong because he painted his apparatus pink, um, it may be, yeah, you shouldn't have painted it pink or whatever. I'm making that one up, obviously. But if you say X is wrong, you annoy a certain number of your colleagues. And therefore, there is a certain matter of delicacy here. Nonetheless, um, the question is, uh, which experiments were good and which were bad? Assuredly, the author does describe 
the oscillating response, which you can in fact find in some experiments. That really is an artifact and people have actually seen it. Okay, more experiments. It is again nonlinear. If the system were linear, this would be completely dull. Double step strain. And so we have a strain gamma, and we will have another strain gamma prime. And if I plot strain, the motion of one plate with respect to the other, here is gamma, and here is gamma prime. And we ask, what does the system do after I displace it the second time? Or if you want to be cute, perfectly legitimate, here is gamma prime, and the second displacement is in direction opposite to the first. Those are very demanding experiments <coughs> to be predicted by any um, system. Okay. Another experiment. Extensional viscosity. The core issue here is extremely ex important commercially. We take a polymer, this is usually done in terms of melts. And what we then do, because the polymeric liquid, is we stretch it. So we have it coming out of something here. And for example, we attach it to a reel there. And we spin the reel very, very quickly. And therefore, if I look at set mark, hypothetical markers in the liquid, the fluid gets stretched out. If I imagine an observer sitting here, what the observer would see is here is the observer's marker, and here is something going this way, and here is something going that way. Now, if you think about this for a moment, you may realize uh, what is happening to the volume of the system if you do this? And the answer is, this is a physics 2 problem, it's a wire for stretching problem. As you stretch the system, the wire the, gets narrower. And this is how you convert a very thick cable into a very thin thread. This is thread drawing. Very important commercially. The important feature of this, though, or an important feature, is zero shear. That is, the top and bottom surfaces of the thing are moving at the same speed. Uh, the, li the liquid is moving apart, so there's inwards compression, but there's no significant shear gradient here, so there's not shear viscosity you're looking at. And there is extensional viscosity. Uh, there are, however, a series of interesting experiments due to Wang Wang. Very nice people. And what they demonstrate is that even if you're extremely careful, you get localized regions where nonlinear things are happening. And the notion that you can just say it's a uniform thread being stretched the same way everywhere along its length at the same time uh, does not hold up to detailed experimental analysis. Yes? Okay, we shall now push on, and we will now push on to discuss what I very loosely describe as modern experiments. Are they really modern? Well, some of them are in the sense that it would have, it would have been much harder to do them a long time ago. Some of them are modern in the sense they have only been done recently. So let us take a few of these. And one of these is shear banding. 
And the issue is as follows. We have a polymer solution. We put it between a pair of plates. And this could, for example, be the two the rotating cone and plate I described, in which the center axis of the cone is way into the blackboard. And there are other ways to do the same experiment. And we set the system to shearing. So we just shear the system, and we ask what happens. And the answer is that if we had a nonlinear, if we had a Newtonian fluid, let's start with Newton. If we had a Newtonian fluid, dvx dy is going to be constant across the height of the system. Yes. So the shear rate, gamma dot, I'm going to plot, here's height, here's gamma dot. This figure is a little unusual in that the independent axis is vertical. And what you have is that the shear rate is constant. However, if you actually do this to real polymer solutions that are adequately concentrated, etc., 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 and do the experiment, what you discover is that the shearing tends to be confined to some fairly narrow bands, as opposed to being the same everywhere. It's as though the fluid had formed yield planes and was yielding near those planes. These appear to be equilibrium shear bands and that if you do things for a long time, everything just sits there. Yes? Now, the actual experiments where shear banding is observed are again due to Tephadia. It's a very clever set of experiments. It was done with a large angle oscillating shear. We'll get to that in a moment. So in fact, the top plate is going back and forth with respect to the bottom plate. And what you find <coughs> in steady state is that you get bands. You get these zones, and inside the zones, the fluid is yielding. And between them, the shear rate is much lower. Well, that's not at all what you would have expected to find from the usual discussion. But that is, in fact, what you find experimentally. We will get to some, a, a more dramatic form of this in a moment. And the more dramatic form of this in a moment, instead of oscillating things, we will look at relaxation after strain. Okay. And the more dramatic form of this is non-quiescent flow. Or relaxation. The issue is as follows, and we're going to need a little bit of a microscopic picture. Here are two plates. I displace one plate with respect to the other through gamma and stop. And so along what was originally this line, there are polymer molecules. After I've done this, the liquid presumptively has moved. And the form of the motion uh, is the phrase that is sometimes used. I'm not sure this will not horrify mathemat uh, mathematicians. Is an affine displacement. And the net result is the polymers that were originally like this are now here. And there's a, there's, a, there's a force that's on the two plates to hold them in place because we displace things. Because um, g of t gamma is not 0. 
And we now ask, what happens? What do the polymers do after you've done this? And the answer is that the polymers move. They do local things. This one rotated. Yes, you can see it's rotated. Uh, this one got stretched, and as time goes on, it retracts. And all of these, in the context of these, this model, diffuse. And because they diffuse, they move relative to their immediate neighbors. The forces between them and their neighbors are reduced. And therefore, because the forces between them and their neighbors are reduced, goes to zero eventually. However, when we're done with all this, suppose I had carefully used bright green polymers along this line. Suppose I wait a long time and g of t gamma goes to zero. Well, the polymers diffuse sideways, so the line gets a little blurry. But during the relaxation, the polymers basically will end up where they started at the moment gamma had occurred. That is, you move things to the side, and they then sit there. They diffuse, but they don't move over any significant distances. And this is a core part of the so-called Doi Edwards picture. Well, that's nice, except you can actually do the experiment I described. You can actually go in, and you can um, well, I'm not sure you'd use green paint as the ideal solution. But you can actually ask what the polymers do. And the answer is, at first, they're doing some sort of relaxation. But then you keep waiting until times that seem to be fairly long with respect to any um, polymer relaxation times. And what you discover is that there is macroscopic motion <coughs> and the shear has resorted itself and the shear is now confined to fair, more confined to more limited regions of space. Now it's not that there is no strain and then there's strain but the amount of the strain in here, displacement per unit distance, may be, oh, say, seven times as large as the strain here. Yes? So there is what happens. OK, that's non-quiescent flow. There are large numbers of models of polymer dynamics most of which do only predict quiescent flow. This is a serious problem for um, polymer models that fail to allow for that. OK. Two final, well, three final techniques. OK. Large angle oscillatory shear. Laos. We look in at, say, the cone and plate experiment. That's supposed to be the top disk of the cone. And we rotate the top with respect to the bottom. And in an oscillatory experiment, there are actually two, there are actually two variables. And one is omega, because the um, delta theta is some theta 0 cosine omega t. There is, that is, there's an oscillation frequency. And the other variable is delta theta, that is, 
how far back and forth are you taking one plate with respect to the other? And in the standard experiment, delta theta is small, a few degrees, and therefore, if I look in like this, the top plate, which is of course a cone of which I've drawn a little piece of cross section, is going back and forth But this displacement is very small relative to this distance. So the, dis the angular displacement of the top cone is a few degrees. That's small angle. However, there's nothing mechanically that requires you to do that. You could also do this. And we therefore have what is called medium angle and large angle oscillatory shear. And in these, the sideways displacement, well, here's the sideways displacement. It's about the same as L. And if you're under this limit, this is medium angle oscillatory displacement. And if you go out here, you have large angle oscillatory displacement. The point of medium and large angle is the polymers sitting here now have to rotate quite considerably if they're being pulled along. And therefore, the, amount, the level of rotation gets to be quite substantial. That's large angle oscillatory shear. And you can actually do the experiments. You can also do experiments where you measure the um, dielectric relaxation at the same time you are doing this. And you should realize you now have the frequency at which you're doing the dielectric relaxation measurements. You have the frequency at which you're doing the oscillation. And the two frequencies are independent. And therefore, life is a little more complicated than it was before. OK, last experiment. Fourier transform. The picture is as follows. We have for example two flat disks and the top disk is oscillating back and forth at omega. We measure the force on the bottom disk. <clears throat> yes? And we can use piezoelectric elements, and we can use electronics, and we can be very clever. And we can actually get a recording of force versus time on the bottom disk that is very precise. And what we say is we will do a Fourier transform of the time record. Now, the simplest part of the Fourier transform is we have this object oscillating back and forth at omega. And therefore, the force on the bottom will have some constants. And there will be an e to the i omega t minus delta. And the omega t is that the force down here oscillates at the same frequency the oscillation up here is occurring. But there is a phase difference. And the phase difference corresponds to the fact that there is a storage as well as a loss modulus. It's like any other driven harmonic oscillator. These are quite heavily damped, but the harmonic oscillator imaging works. OK, well, that's true. However, if I have a long time record, I can look for all of the frequency components, not just the one omega. And if I look at the response as a function of frequency, well, yes, I find a big um, response at omega. But it turns out that the response also has peaks at 3 omega, 5 omega, and so forth. That is, you are seeing a nonlinear response because the system is not linear. And so you're seeing frequency. And 
this case it's frequency tripling. Uh, the optical version would be, say, frequency doubling, but here you get tripling. Now that experiment could be made considerably more elaborate. I have not found this in the literature. It does not mean it is not there. And the notion is that instead of driving at one omega, I have some gadget that's doing the driving. It's computer controlled. And I could drive at two frequencies at the same time. And then I could look for all of the harmonics and combination frequencies. And this is what you do in nonlinear laser optics. Well, this happens to be a mechanical system, but you can do the same thing. You can look for the responses at other frequencies. And now, because we, yes? Question, uh, there's two different frequencies. I didn't quite understand that exactly. Oh, what do I mean two different frequencies? I mean that theta, the angular position of the top plate, is some theta zero cosine omega one t plus theta, I better call this theta one, theta two cosine omega two t plus alpha. That is, I can drive the plate at two different frequencies rather than just one. And if I do that, I can look for the harmonics and combination frequencies. And now we return to chapter three, because chapter three gives us some additional nonlinear phenomena. We are looking at capillary zone electrophoresis. So we have a tube that's very narrow and very long, and it's filled with polymers, polymer solution. And we put things in it which are not really that as big as I've drawn them. And we measure the velocity of the things down the capillary. And the velocity over the measured velocity. How do you measure velocity? Well, you start everything here at the same time. And down here, you have a detector. And the detector sees the things coming by. And so you can measure. You have a length and a time. And therefore, you can infer a velocity. And if you divide the velocity by the applied field, you have an electrophoretic mobility mu. Well, mu shows not some non-linear um, properties. Uh, if we increase the electrical field enough, you discover that mu becomes a function of the driving field. <clears throat> that is, instead of the mobility just being a number, the mobility depends on the applied field. <clears throat> It is unclear, from my, in my reading of the literature, I suspect it's buried there someplace, whether the nonlinear transport effect cuts in above some field or just becomes too small to measure. However, you do have a very controllable, because you can change the field by a lot, system in which you get a nonlinear response to probe motion. And therefore, you have a nonlinear um, viscoelastic response, which you're probing directly. <clears throat> Second, I can plot mu versus probe size. And what you see in the measurements is that mu falls as an exponential or stretched exponential in probe size until you get to a critical probe size. And above that critical probe size, which depends on the polymer concentration in the field, there is a very weak drop off, which is close to a power log. The transition may or may not be perfectly sharp, 
you at least some of the, um, let's do the probes at the same concentration, you can see what appears to be a few points of rounding. Mm -hmm. Now, from the standpoint of the analytic chemist, this is good, but this is very bad because P, the mobility now depends very weakly on probe size, and you can't get separations out here, so this is not good at all. Uh, however, since this crossover and this crossover would appear perhaps to be the same. I didn't say they were the same, I'm not positive, but it looks like they're the same or seem to be the same. It might be the case, you're getting a good separation, you're getting a good separation, you now go to a lower field. And because you go to a lower field, uh, you can get out to higher, larger probes before you run into the problem. And by varying the field strength as you go, you can get rapid separations and you can also get separations that might work at higher feet, at larger probes. Perhaps. I have not done that experiment. However, this is very clearly a nonlinear change in the dynamics. If you ask yourself, what is the variable that is determining the nonlinear change? The answer, based on probe size, field behavior, etc., appears to be <coughs> that this transition corresponds to how much force you're putting on the polymer solution, and the polymer solution behaves as though it has a yield point. Okay, we are almost out of time, so I will remind you with, of what you, we have done. And the answer is we have discussed chapter 14 and a teeny bit of chapter 3 that shows nonlinear effects. And we talked about three sorts of issues. We talked about things that were clearly due to normal stress differences. We didn't talk about the instrumentation problems that come up if you try to measure normal stress differ but they're there. Then we talked about things that arise because the system has memory. There are relax molecular relaxations which take place on time scales so long you can observe them. And finally we talked about some new methods and observations such as shear banding, um, non-quiescent flow electrophoresis. The discussion in this chapter was really at the level of taxonomy. That is, we classified the phenomena, but we didn't try to describe them quantitatively. So that is it for all of the different types of phenomena that I found. I still have the suspicion that there is some sort of experiment I missed and did not include, but I did try to look hard. The next lecture will do a review of all of the experiments and high points of what we found, and then we will have about one or two lectures in which we will actually try to interpret this in terms of polymer models. But that's it for today. <laughs>